World Rugby's decision-making framework for high tackles is a step-by-step -step guide to distinguish between dangerous tackles that warrant a penalty, yellow card or red card. It is a guideline applied by match officials and disciplinary personnel to ensure clear, consistent and accurate officiating and sanctioning and an education tool for players, coaches, media and fans. This framework underpins World Rugby's objective of reducing the risk of head injuries by stimulating player behaviour change from high-risk tackle situations towards safer and lower tackle technique. How does it work? When considering a potential high tackle, match officials must first determine whether the tackle is a shoulder charge or a high tackle. To do this, they must look at the position of the tackler's contact arm at the moment of contact with the ball carrier. This example is a shoulder charge because the contact arm is behind the tackler's body at contact. In this example, the tackler's arm is in front of his body, so it is a high tackle. Depending on whether the match officials are dealing with a shoulder charge or a high tackle, they must ask a series of questions to determine the sanction. First, let's look at the example of a shoulder charge. If dealing with a shoulder charge, the first question the match officials must ask is whether there is any contact between the tackler's shoulder and the head or neck of the tackled player. In this example, there is clear head contact, recognised as per the definition for head contact. Here is an example of a shoulder charge where there is no contact to the head or neck of the ball carrier. Next, the officials must determine the degree of danger. In this example, there is a high degree of danger indicated by the tackler leaves the ground, a dominant tackle attempt and both players at high speed. A high degree of danger without head or neck contact means the initial decision would be a yellow card. If the officials decide the degree of danger is low, the initial decision would be a penalty. In our other shoulder charge example, the degree of danger is automatically assumed to be high because contact is direct to the tackled player's head. In this situation, the initial decision would be a red card. Once an initial decision has been made, the match officials must ask whether there are any aggravating or mitigating factors. The following possible factors may be present, but they must be clear and obvious in order for the sanction to be reduced. In this example, both players are in space and the tackler has a clear line of sight prior to the tackle, so aggravating factors are present. There are also no clear and obvious mitigating factors. Therefore, the final decision remains a yellow card. In this example, there are no clear and obvious mitigating factors, so the final decision remains a red card. Let's look at some more examples, this time of high tackles. The first step for the match officials is to determine whether the high contact is a shoulder charge or a high tackle, using the definition provided for a shoulder charge. If they have eliminated a shoulder charge, then they are dealing with a high tackle and must ask the following four questions to decide on the appropriate sanction. Let's look at some examples that would be sanctioned as high tackles. The first question should be, is the high contact from the tackler's shoulder, head, arm or elbow? In this example, there is direct contact to the tackled player's head from the shoulder of the tackler. The match officials then ask, what is the degree of danger? In this tackle, the degree of danger is high, indicated by a dominant tackle attempt, the tackler accelerates into contact, and the tackler completes the tackle. For a high degree of danger, the initial decision would be a red card. If the officials deem the degree of danger to be low, the initial decision would be a yellow card. In this example, the contact to the tackled player's head is from the upper arm of the tackler. The second question is whether the head or neck contact is direct or indirect. In this example, the head contact is direct. The match officials then ask, what is the degree of danger? In this tackle, the degree of danger is high, indicated by a dominant tackle attempt, 
the tackler accelerates into contact and the tackler completes the tackle. For a high degree of danger, the initial decision would be a red card. If the officials deem the degree of danger to be low, the initial decision would be a yellow card. In this example, the degree of danger is high, indicated by a tackler who runs into contact at high speed and who completes the tackle by following through over the top of the ball carrier. Because the tackler's head contact was indirect, moving up after initial contact lower on the tackled player's body, the initial decision for high degree of danger is a yellow card. In tackles where the degree of danger is low, the initial decision would be a penalty. Once their initial decisions have been made, the match officials must then ask whether there are clear and obvious aggravating or mitigating factors. In this example, there are no clear or obvious mitigating factors. Therefore, the initial decision of a red card remains. Here, the ball carrier has ducked and is running in a low crouched position immediately before contact to the head occurs. The tackler may therefore be considered to be aiming low enough to avoid the head unless the ball carrier dropped suddenly in height, as may be deemed to occur here. The officials may find this sufficient mitigation to reduce the sanction from a red card to a yellow card. Therefore, the final decision after applying mitigation is a yellow card. Here the players are in open space. The tackler has clear line of sight and time before contact, and so aggravating factors exist. Therefore, no mitigation should be applied and the decision remains at a yellow card. Let's take a look at some more examples. In this sequence, we see two tackles. The first is a high tackle because the arm of the tackler is in front of his body at contact and then makes contact with the ball carrier's head. The second tackle is a shoulder charge because the tackler's right arm on the contact side is behind his body at the moment of contact with the ball carrier. The officials must therefore evaluate one high tackle and one shoulder charge. For the high tackle, the first question is which part of the tackler makes contact with the head of the ball carrier. In this case, it's the tackler's arm. The next question is whether the head contact is direct or indirect. Here we clearly see the contact from the arm to the head is direct. The officials next evaluate the degree of danger. Here, the danger level is high because the tackler's arm is moving forward prior to the contact and the tackler completes the tackle. As a result of the direct arm to the head with high danger, the initial decision would be a red card. Let's look at the second tackle in this sequence, which we have deemed to be a shoulder charge because the player's arm is behind the body at the point of contact. The first question for a shoulder charge is whether there is contact to the head or neck of the tackled player. In this example, it's clear the shoulder strikes the head directly. According to the framework, this would result in an initial decision of a red card, because a shoulder charge to the head is automatically deemed to be high in danger. Once their initial decisions have been made, the match officials must decide whether any clear and obvious aggravating or mitigating factors apply. Here, the officials may deem the low height of the ball carrier, along with the bent position of the tackler at contact, to be mitigation against a red card. They may decide to lower the sanction by one and award a yellow card as the final decision. Similar aggravating or mitigating factors may be applied for the shoulder charge example, depending on the official's discretion. They may deem the follow through of the tackle and use of the shoulder to be sufficient to count against mitigation and thus remain with the initial decision of a red card. Another type of high tackle occurs where there is no direct or indirect contact with the tackled player's head. As always, the match officials begin by evaluating whether they are dealing with a shoulder charge or a high tackle. Here, it is clear it's a high tackle because the definition of a shoulder charge is not met. The contact is from the arm of the tackler and there is no shoulder involvement. The officials now ask the four questions for high tackles. For question one, the high contact is from the arm of the tackler. Question two asks whether the high contact is direct or indirect. In this case, we see no head or neck contact at any stage during the tackle. So it is considered high, but without head contact. The official's third question is whether the degree of danger is high or low. For a tackle that does not involve head or neck contact, 
the degree of danger will automatically be low. The initial decision would be a penalty. The final step is to ask whether any aggravating or mitigating factors are clearly and obviously present. In the example, there are no such factors and the initial decision of a penalty remains. Had the referee deemed there to be clear and obvious mitigation, the decision would be to play on. This is an example of a seatbelt tackle and completes the set of possible high tackle scenarios. Let's look at one more high tackle example to revisit the process from start to finish. Here we see a high tackle because the tackler's arm is not in a sling position, nor is it behind the tackler's body at impact. We thus exclude a shoulder charge, where the right arm makes contact with the ball carrier in a high tackle. This means the match officials must ask the four questions. First, they must ask which part of the tackler makes the high contact. Here we see the tackler's upper arm strikes the neck of the ball carrier. The second question is whether neck contact is direct or indirect. In this case, the upper arm to neck contact is direct, even though the tackler's right arm is held lower and makes contact with the ball carrier's body. The primary high contact happens direct to the ball carrier's neck. Third, they ask whether the degree of danger is high or low. Because the tackler is accelerating into the tackle, is attempting a dominant tackle, and completes the tackle, the degree of danger is high. Using the framework, this example of an arm direct to the head or neck with a high degree of danger would result in an initial decision of a red card. The officials now assess whether any clear and obvious aggravating or mitigating factors are present. The body position of the ball carrier may be deemed to be a possible mitigating factor. However, this needs to be clear and obvious and also weighed against the fact that the tackler is in open space with a clear line of sight and time to make a tackle that avoids high contact. Therefore, there is insufficient reason for mitigation and the initial decision of a red card is upheld. Through thorough education and consistent on-field management, World Rugby hopes that player and coach culture will change, having a positive impact on injury prevention.